Today I'm going to be reviewing the Zima board, a small form factor computer aimed at server applications. Compared to a lot of other small form factor computers, this system has pretty exceptional I.O. with dual SATA ports, power to run 3.5 inch hard drives, and a PCI Express slot to run almost any expansion card you could want in this system. This system is super flexible and can fulfill a lot of different needs. This system actually comes in multiple different specifications with different processors and amounts of memory. Zima board was kind enough to provide me with two units for review, but this review is all my thoughts and they haven't reviewed this video before you guys can see it. In this video, I'm going to be going over the board overview, a lot of my testing about the different performance, thermal, and other characteristics of the system, and some applications I think would work well in. Let's first take a look at what comes in the box. Included in the box is the Zima board itself, a 12 volt 3 amp power adapter, and a SATA cable to allow you to power one drive. There's another SATA adapter you can get for a little bit extra that allows you to power two drives instead of one. Taking a look at the physical board itself, the first thing I notice is the large heatsink. As this is passively cooled, it's a fairly large heatsink to keep the amount of heat down. But I much prefer this to a tiny little whiny fan. Looking at the back of the system, I can start seeing the ports. There's a 12 volt power in that plugs into the included power adapter. Dual gigabit ethernet ports powered by Realtek RT8211 chips. Although Realtek chips are generally regarded as worse than Intel or other brands of network cards, I didn't have any issues in my testing with these chips. Underneath those network jacks, there's dual 5 gigabit USB 3 ports, and then a DisplayPort 1.2 port that's capable of doing 4K 60fps. Looking at the next side of the system is a PCIe Gen 2 X4 link. This allows you to put almost any PCIe card in it. I'll go over that in a little bit more later. But one annoyance is the little metal bracket on a PCIe card can cover the little mini DisplayPort port. So you'll likely want to take off the metal bracket on your card so you can see the display out and have a PCIe card at the same time. On the back of the unit is the two SATA ports and the little SATA power port that goes into the breakout adapter to power the two drives. There's also two indicator lights on this system that's covered mostly by this plastic. They glow red for power on the system, and there's a little white LED that blinks whenever there's I.O. activity on the SATA port. There are four screws on the bottom of the system. Removing those screws gives you access to the bottom of the board and the CMOS battery, which you can unplug if you want to be able to reset the CMOS on this board. Removing two more screws allows the board to be removed from the heatsink, but unfortunately there isn't anything else that's easily user replaceable on this board. It does give me a nice look at all the components on this board, where I'm able to see the processor itself, the memory for the processor, the NAND flash that works as EMMC storage, and a few of the other controllers and power management for this board. Overall, it looks well constructed and I don't see any issues looking at the board itself. Now let's take a look at the power, performance, and thermals of the Zima board. The Zima board is built around the Intel Celeron SoC, either the N3350 or N3450 depending on the model that you get. These processors are part of Intel's Apollo Lake generation and are kind of the Atom class of processors. Using little cores, these products are designed to be low cost, low power, and fit in devices like the Zima board, where they're able to be cooled passively thanks to the low power consumption. And speaking about power consumption, the Zima board really excels here. It was using just a hair over 5 watts in my idle test for both of the different CPU models. So that would be at the desktop with a monitor plugged in and keyboards and mice. When under max CPU load, the low end model uses roughly 10 watts from the wall, and the higher end model with the quad core N3450 processor uses about 15 watts from the wall. When both the CPU and onboard graphics of these systems are running at maximum load, they both sit at a bit over 20 watts from the wall. They also report about 15 watts of power usage, which is their power limit. Zima board has set the power limit for the PL1 and PL2 to 15 watts which I'm guessing is about as high as Intel lets you set it on these systems, and is fortunately well over the 6 watt TDP that these chips are rated at. The dual core N3350 processor doesn't report any throttling in my testing, but the N3450 processor has a bit of power throttling when both the CPU is running at maximum load and the iGPU is being pushed to the maximum, dropping from about 2.1 GHz max turbo down to about 1.8 GHz. If you aren't using the GPU, I didn't find any way to get the CPU alone to throttle, and for a lot of home server workloads, you won't see any power throttling. I couldn't get the Zima board to do any thermal throttling. When the CPU and GPU were being maxed out and it was limited by its power limitations, this system would sit in the high 80 degrees Celsius on the CPU or SOC. What worried me a little bit was the case temperature, which was in the high 70s Celsius as reported by one of those little IR thermometers which is pretty darn hot and well over the temperatures that I'd normally want to be touching. 
If you are using the CPU and GPU on the system for sustained workloads, make sure to be careful about keeping things away from it. I wish it would be a little bit easier to plug a CPU fan into it. It seems like they thought about having a CPU fan because there's a header on the board and there's ways to control it in the BIOS, but there's no real way to plug anything into it and it's not a standard fan header either. But under more normal CPU only workloads, the temperatures are much more reasonable. Even maxing out the CPU alone at 100% didn't really get it that hot with maximum temperatures being in about 60 degrees and the case being under 50 degrees. Now let's take a look at the CPU performance of the Zima board. With its low power processor, you can't expect the fastest performance, and it's definitely a lot slower than some of the other systems I have. But those systems also pull many times more power than this system. I ran some of these benchmarks here using common utilities like Cinebench R23, 7-Zip, and ZST with the commands on screen in case you want to run them on your system and compare your results to the Zima board or other systems that I have. But I want to try to put these benchmark numbers that just give you a number into something that makes a little bit more sense. When it comes to qualitative performance or how the system feels when using an operating system, the A32 system was pretty snappy with almost every operating system I threw at it. Installing programs was fairly fast, setting up little servers worked fine, editing config files didn't have any noticeable delay or issue, and working with web interfaces for little control panels also worked very well. The 232 system with its 2GB of RAM shows its limitations when running heavier GUI-based operating systems. Things like GNOME 3 or KDE or Windows really pushes the limits of 2GB of RAM, and I'd keep this 2GB of RAM system to either having no GUI on it or to having a very lightweight GUI if at all possible. Another way to take a look at performance of the CPU that might make sense on a home server application is video encoding performance. I wanted to take a look at how fast the system can transcode video from H.264 to H.264 using its CPU power alone using the X.264 encoder. The slower processor on the 232 had to use the ultra-fast preset to do this at real time for 30 FPS video, but the faster 832 processor could use the very fast preset and still get real time encoding performance. But the nice thing with this system is it isn't limited to CPU alone for doing video encoding. There's also the Onboards Graphics Quick Sync Video Encoder, which allows for hardware video encoding of H.264, H.265, and a couple other formats. Here's a nice little Wikipedia table that shows what this Apollo Lake is capable of doing in terms of formats. It's capable of doing pretty much all you could want with H.264 and some H.265. Since this is a bit older of a processor, newer formats like AV1 and VP9 aren't going to be supported on hardware for this system. These onboard graphics are actually pretty impressive when it comes to video encoding. And when I tried doing transcoding for services like Jellyfin, it works fairly well. 4K transcoding is actually reasonably doable on the iGPU on the system. 4K to 1080p works pretty well and you can get away with actually doing two streams that way. And 1080p to 1080p works very well. I didn't do much performance testing with the onboard graphics on this processor because I don't find the onboard graphics super useful for most home server applications. It runs a desktop image like this just fine. It can do 4K 60 output if you want to plug it into a 4K monitor for anything. This system has 32 gigabytes of EMMC storage, which is essentially a soldered on SD card. This system is kind of in between a mechanical hard drive and an SSD in performance, but thanks to its relatively decent random IO performance, it installs OSs and is relatively snappy like you'd expect an SSD to be. I didn't have any issues using it as onboard storage for installing your operating system as it's probably intended to be used as. And when using smaller operating systems like Linux and most NAS OS's, it's perfectly fine, but if you want to run something larger like Windows, it's likely a little bit limiting. And if you need to run multiple applications or store any data, you probably want to add a storage drive, and the nice thing is those storage drives are able to fully utilize the SATA 3 bus, and you get the full speed out of your SATA drives. Now let's take a look at what I consider to be most exciting part of the Zima board, which is this PCI Express slot. The great thing with this PCI Express slot is you can put almost any card you want into the system, allowing almost unlimited expandability. You can go put a network card for better network expansion. You can go put a SATA card to put more drives on the system. You can go put an SSD if you want high speed storage, and you can do a lot of other things. The other nice thing that Zima board did was they have the end cutoff. That way you can put an X8 or X16 card in this slot. So even though those can't run at the full bandwidth, they still physically fit and work in this system. And I tried many different cards in the system, like SSDs, like an Intel 900P and an M.2 converter, and those all worked just fine. I tried using a 10 gigabit network card, and I was able to max out my 10 gigabit connection using iPerf just fine in this system. I tried using a quad 1 gigabit network card in the system, it worked just fine, and I had access to all six network cards in total on the system. 
I tried using a low power GPU like a GT 1030 which worked and showed up just fine in the system. Although one thing I noticed when adding a GPU, it's not the primary GPU on the system. So that means whenever you see the boot screen or something, it's still on the onboard graphics and not on my GPU. Potentially it was just the GPU I was testing with, but I'm guessing that's a setting they had in the BIOS and I couldn't see a way in the BIOS to change the primary adapter. I didn't have a high power GPU to test on the system and I personally don't see it as making a ton of sense because you need another power adapter in some way to make that all work and hook up because the system is not designed to power a high powered GPU at the same time. And for a lot of workloads that I plug a high powered GPU into, I'd likely want a little bit more CPU power than this system offers. The only PCI Express cards I couldn't get working was the ones using these LSI HBAs. I tried multiple different cards, but unfortunately none of them worked. I couldn't figure out exactly why. I asked Zima board support and I haven't heard back from them. If I know anything about it, I'll put it in the comments below to let you guys know what happened and why these cards aren't working. Software wise, the Zima board comes pre-installed at Kesa OS, an operating system made by Icewell, the same company that makes the Zima board itself. It's a nice little web interface for managing Docker containers and lets you easily install Docker containers, go to their web interfaces, manage storage, and a little bit more. It's a bit lacking when it comes to features and how things are set up under the hood in my opinion, but I can go into a deeper video, go over all the little nidbits of how it's set up and how it works if you'd like. Leave a comment below if you want me to go more in depth on Kesa OS. But the great thing with the Zima board is you're not limited to Kesa OS. It just happens to be pre-installed on the system. You can install basically any OS that runs on an x86 system on this computer. You can run almost any desktop Linux distribution on this system that you could want. Almost every NAS OS like Open Media Vault, Unraid, TrueNAS, and a lot more will run fine. Router OSs, so something like PFSense, OpenSense, Untangle, and a lot more will run on this system. And even Windows will run on this system or Windows Server if you need Windows Server on it. One thing to note is due to its older hardware, Windows 11 will throw an error when you try to install saying it does not meet the system requirement. Now let's talk about applications of the Zima board. The Zima board is advertised as a do-it-all home server, capable of running many different programs, applications, and containers at the same time on one piece of hardware and being your kind of cloud replacement computer. And it does reasonably well at that. If you keep everything to using containers instead of VMs, resource allocation should be relatively low and the 8 gigabytes of memory should be able to go relatively far. And being able to store two 3.5 inch hard drives, which are now up to about 22 terabytes maximum in size, should be quite a bit of storage for a lot of home users. It definitely is not the fastest and most capable system, but it's also pretty low cost and super low power and fanless, which makes up for it in a lot of use cases. If you know your resources are relatively low, this system works really well for you. If you're new to setting up a home lab or personal cloud, this can be a good unit to start at because it's relatively low cost, low power, and it's easy to kind of stay out of the way. But if you're someone like me who already has a big system and is committed to running too many VMs that this little system would struggle to run at, it also makes a pretty good secondary system for some applications. One good application I've seen for it is a backup appliance. You can easily set it up as a basic Samba share system. I found it easy to plug two three and a half inch hard drives into this system, plug the 232 model in, because a lot of NAS operating systems like Open Media Vault are perfectly happy with only two gigabytes of RAM and a slow processor. It easily fills gigabit, and is more than capable of kind of backing up other files you might have on other systems. If you want to run backup software like Veeam or PBS or something, I'd get the higher end 832 model as those are often very memory intensive at times and want a little bit of CPU power to process data. And it can be a nice unit to kind of allocate all your backups from multiple systems, servers, laptops, or other devices into one node, and then you have the backup server itself managing those and removing old versions as you see fit. Another kind of good secondary use case application for this system is a router. Super low power, fanless, and works great for gigabit connections. And with its PCIe slot, you can easily add a PCI Express network card and have four more NICs on it quite easily. So then you have a six port network card. Or you could add faster network interfaces like 2.5 or 10 gigabit, but I don't think the CPU is going to be enough to do full 10 gigabit routing. Another interesting use case if you already have a more intensive home lab is as kind of a cluster quorum system. So for example, Proxmox and many other clusters want to have three systems. That way if one system is a little bit off, you still have two systems to agree. And if you don't want to commit to having three large full power systems and have this as the last node in the cluster. So that way, if those systems disagree, this system has that third vote to keep all the systems in the cluster alive and happy. Overall, the Zima board works pretty well as a low power, 
low cost and physically small home server that can fit into a home environment pretty well without sticking out and being loud like a lot of the used high power servers are doing. It also has a super cool feature of having a PCI Express slot allowing you to expand it in many different ways and being able to use three and a half inch hard drives means you can easily add a lot of bulk cheap storage to this system. I didn't run into any deal breakers when testing this system. In comparison to other mini PCs on the market, the standout features of PCI Express and SATA are super nice to have, although those other mini PCs often have newer processors which are a bit faster, and they often have SODIMs for memory which means they can be easily upgradable to having more memory, and they often have M.2 NVMe drives which are faster and larger than the EMMC storage on this system. You can also compare it to other units like a pre-built server or a larger desktop class platform, but those systems do use significantly more power. They also give you significantly more expansion and upgrade capabilities. So a lot of it comes into deciding how much capability you need in the server and what features you like on this. But I think the system does work as a pretty good balance for a lot of home labos who want a small low power server. And it's also pretty flexible as kind of a second server if you want to have a second backup or router or something like that in your home lab. Let me know what you think of this unit in the comments below and thanks for watching this video.